Hey guys, hope everybody's having a good week. Um, I'm glad you guys uh, logged in here. I'm going to do this class and just to uh, reiterate on key still just now, I mean, some of the safety stuff talks may or may not apply, but this one, especially, I mean, we do a lot of work in schools, daycares and whatnot. Do not let a kid be around you when you're working period. It's, it's not going to end well for anybody. Um, anyway, uh, we're going to go through the uh, uh, project life cycle. And what I mean by that, I, I guess, first of all, if you have everybody to look up on the top left hand side, our Pyrotex logo, which was created in about two minutes originally, maybe three from a guy that did the first magnet that stuck on our truck. It's, it's kind of where that first logo came from. And we were, I ran with it and just never bothered changing it. Uh, we, we've got the new logo now, which you'll start seeing on our documentation and and whatnot and on on shirts and whatnot eventually it's just a it's a little more clean doesn't have all the flames and stuff so anyway um project life cycle what what, what happens what's the whole you know a lot of you guys you know you know we only see part of what's going on and we're just going to give you a big wide uh you know kind of a bird's eye view of what happens in the project of a, a, a life you know, of a typical uh, construction project. Uh, uh, first thing, estimating and sales. Before anything happens, any screws are turned, any work is performed, cables pulled, any equipment ordered, invoices are sent, anything's collected, something must be sold. Um, <laughs> as a contractor, I used to call on quite a bit and, and, and one of the guys uh, took it upon himself in parentheses to write after that uh, or low bid. <laughs> uh and, that, and i'm there's some truth to that i i just didn't put it on here but if any of you are thinking that uh it's been thought of before uh if you know this or not uh typically especially these days our, our guys are bidding 30 or more maybe sometimes as many as 50 jobs before we get one uh it's, it's pretty competitive out there you know so that means they've looked at 30 other sets of specs, 40 other sets of specs and drawings and, 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 and hopefully addendas, uh, notes, you know, all kind of stuff that goes into bidding a job. So there's a, you know, before you get the one job you're doing, many others have been, have been looked at, you know, once a project is sold, you know, the, the sales guy the estimator is still involved to some degree, uh, depending on the job and he's, he's pricing change orders, uh, he's dealing with coordination. A lot of times he may have been the original contact on the job. And sometimes it's, you know, getting them to pass that baton to onto our project managers is sometimes easier said than done because people like dealing with the person they've dealt with from the start. And uh, it's, just, it's just part of it. I was in sales for years and years and just, just part of it, you get used to it. Once we get a job, um, paperwork. Uh, this is an end you guys aren't, you know, much, much involved in. Uh, there's paperwork. Uh, oftentimes, you know, unless it's a little lease build out or something we're doing for a smaller contractor who just signs our quote and we move on. There's a, there's a contract we have to sign. Most contracts are written in the general contractor's favor. So usually if we, if we have to go to the point, we've got to pull out the contract to settle a resolution. We've probably are not in a good place to do that we, we we try to avoid that there's lots of stuff that's in the contract that you know obviously the contract amount how much you know the scheduling and you know we all know how terrible most folks are at actually scheduling and coming up with an actual an actual schedule for a uh, construction project however having said that 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 schedule and especially that completion date is often part of that contract and what can save us Sometimes let's say they've got, uh, you know, they're, they're showing in their schedule for ceiling tile scheduled to go in, let's say June 1st, and that ceiling tile doesn't go in until September 1st. Well, there's three months that put us behind and, and, and we can use that to help uh, fight some battles here and there. Um, insurance requirements, uh, I just threw that in there just so you know that, you know, we've got, you know, most sites require some certain paperwork from our insurance company and they they do that pretty quickly uh once in, once in a while we have to actually bond a job uh doesn't happen very often but it's it's, it's part of it it's uh, we probably bond 
one job a year, um, if that. Uh, other paperwork, other forms we have to fill out, especially for some of these schools. They, they, you know, nobody's used asbestos in years and years, but we've always got to sign an asbestos form and a non-hazardous form and just just a bunch of paperwork. So, anyway, there's just some 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 hoops we have to have to jump through there. Um, once we get through all that, and and, and actually often it's kind of happening at the same time. Uh, you know, job moves on to the uh, design phase, which is where Keith or somebody else, you know, starts to put together our shop drawings, our submittal documents, um, other stuff, things, forms, et cetera, that, that, that may be required to submit to the architect and to the uh, AHJ if it's a fire alarm uh, or access control project. Uh, we really try guys to be accurate here. Um, Keith can, you know, attest to the fact that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on him, and, and, you know, and, and have been from the start to make sure these bill of material on these, on, on these projects are accurate. Uh, we, we, we really make an effort for it to be, um, having said that, sometimes some mistakes are made. We try not to have these mistakes, but that, that bill of material, which goes into this, uh, into our submittals is, is, is very important. Uh, when you're looking over a job, if you, if you happen to notice a mistake or you question something, please bring it up because it's a real headache if we, uh, you know, most time I'm gonna order off of that bill of material. And, and if, you know, for, for, for some reason we've got, we're short 50 smoke detectors or we're over, you know, 50 stopper covers for, for some reason and you notice it, please let us know. A lot of times during this design process, too, you guys may not know this, but we go ahead and we started doing this probably three or four years ago, even. Uh, every Most jobs require closeout documents, o &M manuals, as built, uh, warranty letter and whatnot. Uh, we usually go ahead and knock those out when we do the design, if we can, especially if it's systems that we, we, we normally you know, work with that way when we get the call at the end of the job and they're looking for closeout documents, we've, we've got them and we're not scrambling to, uh, to recreate something. So anyway, the next thing that happens is uh, project management. And I, 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 this is a little light on this slide, but uh, you know, this is where we start to look at manpower. Who's gonna be performing the job? What's the schedule like? When, when is it gonna start? You know, we get some jobs that we may finish the design and the submittals in, in January. And, and we know that the real job start time's not till June, May, June, you know, so we, we, we can't, you know, we don't necessarily know ahead from January to June, who's necessarily gonna be starting a job. Uh, usually uh, Bryant, Mark are, are taking a look at this stuff kind of as we as we get closer, uh, occasionally vi visiting a job site, you know, just, just seeing where we're seeing where we're at, seeing how close they are to an actual, you know, to, to a realistic schedule. There's just a lot of things involved, a lot of moving situations. You know, sometimes you may wonder, you know, why did I end up on this job or or who put me here? I know we try to make it. Uh, <laughs> You know, I used to, I worked for another big company and the, and the joke used to be, you know, you had to, you had to drive by, you know, four or five of their existing jobs every day before you got to yours. We try not to make that happen, you know, but there's going to be time. Some guy living down South may be doing a job in Conroe or a guy living in Conroe may be doing a job way down South. We, we take that in, into consideration a little bit, but that's, that, that's not our only, uh, our only reason that you know workload who's doing what the complexity of the job just just a lot of other a lot of other things so next thing that happens and we did a whole class on this uh a few weeks back job site mobilization i'm just going to touch on it um you know know the details of your job know what you're doing uh take some time to understand your job any challenges that are in it don't you know, you can't just hit a job with a, with a, with a set of drawings and, and know that the easiest thing you have to do on this job is pull strobe circuits and start pulling strobe circuits without paying attention to the, the things that are going to be more challenging, such as uh, what am I doing with the air handler shutdown? Uh, what's the status of the sprinkler system? Is there, a, is there a, a sprinkler pit on the job where an electrician needs to get conduit out to the street? You know, all that kind of stuff. What's the status with the elevator? Uh, you know, the, the things that come back and are difficult at the end of the job, if we can get a handle on them 
up front, it makes for a much simpler completion. Uh, what's the status of the permit? Do we have a permit? Uh, who's the HJ? Uh, very important to know who's our customer. Who are we working for? Uh, we got some projects where we, you know, we 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 may work for the same general contractor and the same electrical contractor. One job, our customer may be the electrical contractor. The next job, our customer may be the general contractor. But that electrical contractor still happens to be his customer on the job. We, you know, we got to play a little bit of politics. It's, it's kind of a, a, a dance sometimes, especially dealing with, 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 with electrical contractors and getting our conduits, our sleeves and whatnot in of not throwing, even if they're not our customer, not completely throwing them under the bus and giving them an opportunity to uh, perform before we start sending nasty emails and whatnot. Um, what are the trades and systems we're working with? Who, who am I dealing with for the uh, air handler shutdown? Who am I dealing with for the sprinklers? You know, if you, you know, do you notice anything? Hey, they're just showing a water flow and a tamper here, but you walk on the job and you see 10 sprinkler risers spread out throughout the facility, or you see a, a dry system going in, or, uh, you know, just, just anything else you can see that, that may be out of the, the ordinary that needs to be brought up to the uh, project manager. Oh, next thing that happens, and you guys are all familiar with this. I'm going to run right through it. You know, the typical phases of a job, cable, you know, after mobilization and looking over the job is, you know, we all know cables and support, uh, especially on schools. Um, we, we've got some engineers and some district people that are just picky about colors and sizes of cable. For some reason, they think it's really important. Where when we were doing just, when we were doing just commercial work, I mean, nobody cared. Blue SLC, red strobes, yellow speakers, and we did it all day long and nobody gave us a second thought. Once we started doing schools, <clears throat> we found out that they, they care a little bit more. You know, some want all red, some want color codes. There's still some engineers that are, that, that are living in the 1980s that think strobes will only work on 14 gauge wire. Where in the in the 19, early 1980s, if you put more than seven strobes on a circuit, even if it was 14 gauge wire, your power supply would drop out. I don't know. Some folks don't keep up with what's going on in the world, but a lot of technology has changed since the early 80s. You know, we can put 20 something strobes on a on a pair of 16 gauge wire, and it and it holds up just fine. Um, I don't know why they won't change. I'm assuming these same people use the internet and probably look at face world once in a while, but they like the 14 gauge wire. Nevertheless, know what cable we're, we're using uh, and, and, and anything else that they're gonna be you know, picky about. Last thing we wanna ever do is have to go out and pull cable out of a job. That's the reason I don't, we, we don't buy anything but FPLP cable. I know a lot of you guys know we, we, we could actually use FPL cable in some places. We use plenum cable. It, it works and, and uh, everywhere and meets every code. So we just, for the couple of dollars we saved, it's, it's not worth it. Our jobs for the most part are going to be successful. A lot of it depends on the cable being installed correctly and complete. Don't leave big pieces to be done later. Um, most of us don't have photographic memories. If you can get the wire pulled everywhere, get it pulled everywhere. The trim out, be clean, be accurate. Take notes, please take notes. If, if, if there's, especially, especially if it's a big and complicated job, make sure you're marking up your drawings. If you're not sure, ask questions. Uh, if there's a big question on, and, and this has came up here a while back on SLC addresses, and you've got one set of addresses on your drawings and, and something's not making sense, before you go and change the entire addressing scheme on a whole job, pick up the phone and call Keith. Our, our preference is gonna to be to do whatever saves the least time. It's a whole lot easier for, for Keith to sit here and change some addresses than it is for you to, to go ahead and change them them all if, if something got sideways for, for whatever reason. Anyway, be organized, be organized, be organized. That'll, that, will, that will save your bacon and, and save time uh, each and every time. Next five phase, energizing the system. You got to turn it on. You got to energize it. Before you do that, please make sure your connections are right. Your circuits are metered. You know, double check. I was in the field a long time and I energized some big, big systems in my day. I'm talking about systems that, you know, 30, 40, 60 story buildings. Um, I was a little bit anal about making real sure before I hit that breaker that there was nothing really bizarre happening, you know, uh, took a fresh look at it. Uh, 
we don't want to blow up a panel. We don't want to energize a circuit, you know, and, and put a bunch of voltage out on an SLC circuit and, and burn up 100 smoke detectors. So please know what you're doing. Uh, Pre-testing, be accurate, be thorough, be complete. This is important, guys. The And here's what's going to happen. that the, the devices that you don't test are going to be the ones that fail in front of the fire marshal. The devices that you you know, that may be a little bit of a pain in the neck too, that you just, you didn't want to get to at the end of the day because you're tired and wanted to go home, but you go ahead and test it anyway. Um, those are the ones that are going to, you know, they shouldn't give you any grief, uh, you know, doing your final inspection. Um, next thing we're usually doing is final inspections. Uh, please be prepared. Um, I've done a lot of fire marshal inspections in my life and, uh, I know when I was very first doing them, I showed up on a couple out in uh, Los Angeles where I first got started doing this and didn't have my drawings right or didn't know this or that. And it was, it was kind of embarrassing. I didn't let it happen very often. And, you know, those guys, uh, I don't know, they were kind of jerks. They, they, they could be and they didn't, you know, it, it was kind of embarrassing. I learned pretty quickly to make sure I had my drawings and I had my permit in order and I had smoke and, uh, or magnets and tools, you know, whatever I needed to uh, to do this inspection. Um, finally, closeouts, you know, we got to close the job out, you know, as built, take pictures of them, send them to Keith. I'm not sure, are we doing that a lot right now? I don't get very many. When well, I do get them, I put them in the- We, we, need, to, we need to get better at that guy. That's one of the guys, that's one of the things we're, you know, technically supposed to be doing. It can be digital, take a picture of them, send them to Keith. Uh, FML 009s, we need copies of those, get them to the project manager. System training, a lot of, most projects we have to do training uh, with, with somebody. Uh, it's, it's usually part of a closeout document that's in the spec. Uh, make sure we're getting a, a form signed. If you don't have it, Mark has them, can send it to you. They can, you know, sign it digitally, just, just even, even if it's one person. And even if, it, you know, if, if they know the system backwards and forwards, and then you're there with them for five minutes. Just just get something signed because here's what happens. There's a there's a there's a somebody in an engineering firm that part of their closeout documents they're going to want to see the training form. Trying to explain to some of these folks this same guy didn't need training and he's got 15 of these other systems and I've got a you know somebody's just trying to cross a T and dot an I. They want to see the form. So if you're doing any training, even if it's one person. Just have them, sign, have them sign it so we've got the paperwork to send in. Oh, the last question on there, if anybody noticed it, what phase is not in the job? Troubleshooting is not a job phase. My notes on that are pretty obvious on this page. Uh, any questions? I understand that there's gonna be a little bit of, uh, there's gonna be a little bit of, uh, uh, troubleshooting from time to time. I know it's not going to be zero, but it's not a major part of the job. I brought a lot of systems up in my day and it was always kind of a goal of mine to bring it up with a clean and green panel. Didn't always work. There might be a, a horn circuit, something I had polarity backwards or, or you know, a, a joint, you know, a loop that I didn't realize I had not connected in or something, but, but troubleshooting should not be a major part of the prod of the project. Um, you guys know that's nobody enjoys troubleshooting their own work. Uh, anyway, enough said on that. Other items that we have to deal with, just 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 so you guys know, kind of what all's involved. We we bill on on construction typically between the fifteenth and twenty fifth of each month. There's most uh, uh, contracts have a you know a date that you're supposed to have your invoice in by that we bill for the work that's currently done in the month. So if you're on a long project, just so you know that you know it's what's building. January's work done in January and then you know what's done in February is built in February which a lot of times is why Mark is you know probably calling hey where we're at where we're going to be at the end of the month it's very important when we have those conversations that uh, that we be accurate believe it or not being overbilled is kind of a pain in the neck the, number one it's kind of embarrassing when they they catch it which that doesn't happen very often but it's also a pain in the neck and for some reason we get massively overbilled the money comes in, it gets spent on every other doggone bill that we have to pay for. And then the next month, we've got a bunch of labor on the job and we don't have really have the billing to cover it. So anyway, try to be accurate, ordering equipment, 
you know, insurance requirements. There's some remaining job closeout work that we have to do, warranties, other documents, you know, just it's different from job to job, but they're all basically the same. Uh, so final billing that we do, some retainage billing. Uh, I don't know if you guys know or not, but on most construction jobs, there's something called retainage. If we bill a $100 uh, for something, typically they're holding back 10% or $10 of that. Sometimes it's 5% on each job until until the job's over with uh, and then and then um you know if all goes well uh, especially on the commercial side uh we turn it over to colin and hopefully pursue the, and get the inspection service agreements on those things and then uh last but not least and i didn't put it on here if all this goes successfully uh that 30 or 40 jobs that we're talking about bidding to get one if we get and keep our repeat customers you know, that percentage and that number of jobs goes down because we have, you know, contractors that like to uh, to work with us and hopefully give us the next job, which keeps, uh, you know, everybody employed, everything moving forward. And uh, as we all know, especially these days, and that's extremely important and extremely valuable things. So anyway, I think I've talked long enough. Do we have any any questions? Hey, Mike. Yeah. Um, hey, yeah. Just a couple of things I just want to throw in there. Uh, Monitoring is always an issue at the end of these jobs. We, you know, I send monitoring out probably a month in advance and it, it's always the last minute that we get this. So we need to make sure we stay on top of that in the field as well. And also uh, testing, uh, testing signals. We got to remember that every job that we do, we have to test signals. I know we're, we've been pretty good at that, but let's don't, uh, let's don't fall down on that. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, always good to, to reiterate. I know that's yeah. been covered in some previous classes, but yes, that, that, you know, it didn't used to be, you know, it used to be all they cared about was alarm trouble supervisory mm -hmm. and that th those days are gone. So the, the, the signals matching up is real important. And in, in, in some of our, you know, depending on who's working at the central station, some of them have a little higher level of brain power than others. <laughs> So yeah, that, that that's real important. And if you're if you're testing every device in your pretest, um, just call. Hopefully by that point your phone lines are up and working, so you can kind of kill two birds with one stone. I have a thing we can add, Keith. Okay. Hey, it'd probably be a good thing to get all the text set up with the uh, stages app. Okay. Are so, we not all set up? I thought we were at one point. No, I don't think we all are. Okay. I'm set, I'm set up, but I'm not sure. Okay, if want. anyone on here isn't set up with stages, which is how we uh, we have an app that works with UCC, that's the monitoring company that we contract with. Um, if you're not set up, send me an email and I'll get you set up. Yeah, I think I needed some more information for that. Okay. And we just hey, need nah, to uh, Colin, I don't have no questions. We need to make sure too that programming is right. So we can please stay on top of that as well. Yeah, let's keep in mind, guys, we, we've got a couple of programmers. Uh, I know uh, Brandon hits a lot of those, and Ed uh, Jr. has been helping out a lot with these things, too. So um, let, let's keep in mind that if we need to do that in advance, let's make it happen because the, sometimes we can't call on them the next day. All right, thank you all for being here. Um, one of the things Mike was talking about was uh, metering the circuits and trying to bring up a clean green panel. Helping y'all do that is one of the, the main reasons we have these trainings, whether it's wiring up a more technical thing like the elevator shunt trip power loss or a smoke damper like we've talked about in the last few weeks. Uh, going forward, I'm going to start talking about wiring up some panels. I'm going to start with some power supplies. And so I'll be reviewing a lot of those metering techniques for metering your circuit before we connect it to a panel. But I'm going to try to have it set up with a live demonstration where I'm showing you the metering as I trim out a panel that I'll have hung on a wall somewhere here at the shop. Um, so hopefully that'll help eliminate that troubleshooting. And if there is any troubleshooting, help speed it up so that we don't turn it into a major phase of the job. Um, but I think that's all we have for the week. So uh, again, thank you all for being here and y'all stay safe out there.